Good afternoon, good evening, good night, wherever you may be. Thank you very much for logging into this webinar. My name is Kai Sonder. I work at CIMIT, the International Maize and Wheat Improvement Institute, and I'm part of the CGRS platform for big data and agriculture. In this case, um, the community of practice for geospatial work, which Jabuku is also online, is coordinating. And um, we've had a, a couple of webinars on topics that are relevant or that we think that are relevant on, on our work, use of geospatial data and development and other topics. Um, and in the last two years, I've had the pleasure to work with David Gerena, a colleague who's now at the Alliance of Seattle and Biodiversity. Um, interesting background, he can tell you a few things about himself now. And I come from a soil science background originally and for many years doing GIS analysis, doing foresight work, soil data or good soil data has been one of the limiting things, especially also in, in extension if you want to give recommendations to lots of farmers Soil sampling is expensive, so any way we have nowadays to improve um, access to soil data and good maps, good uh, spatial data layers that can be used to make decisions and guide decisions on, on fertilizer, fertilizer use to avoid the wrong type of fertilizer being used, or wrong recommendations, and to being able to serve a lot of farmers and extensionists and other specialists to make better decisions in that sense. Um, Digital soil mapping nowadays is a very interesting alternative. And uh, David Gerena and Jake Campolo from Stanford University have been working on this in, in Nepal and in Mexico. I've had the pleasure of working with David on this in Mexico, where a lot of soil data is floating around, not necessarily at the right resolution. There's a lot of individual soil samples, often not georeferenced, and we've been collecting maybe the last 10 years and been using geostatistical approaches, but nowadays with machine learning and other options you will hear about, there's a lot of potential in that. So David, please start. Sure, uh, let me share the screen. Okay, uh, Jewu or Kai, can you see the screen now? Yes, it's good. Okay, great. Uh, as Kai said, my name is uh, David Gerena and I work with uh, SIAT, uh, the Alliance for SIAT Bio Biodiversity, and um, my fellow co-presenter is Jake Campolo at Stanford University. So uh, we'll be presenting uh, a bit of a background on some of the work that we did and then focusing on two case studies for applications of uh, digital soil mapping and inferencing uh, soils to management, in this case fertilizer application. And one case study would be in Mexico, as Kai said, and, and the other one will be in Nepal. So uh, I like to kind of start any topic on soil science with a bit of, of interesting sort of background information about soils. You know, many people, so my background is soil science too. Uh, like Kai, we come from a very similar background in soil science and both move towards uh, geospatial uh, work out of necessity, um, looking at moving past plots and into landscapes. So many of us may not uh, be aware of how important soil is in, in our daily lives and in who we define ourselves. And I'll, I'll give three really interesting examples that I think are, are cool. The first one on the left is the Panch Tattva, which is part of the Hindu mythology. It represents the five critical and essential truths in this world. And one of the Panch Tattva is soil. So soil makes up one of the essential critical truths for the world according to the Hindus. Uh, on the right, we see an image of Adam and Eve, the proverbial first two human beings on the planet. In Hebrew, Adam translates as Adama and Eve translates as Ahava. And Adama in Hebrew means soil and Ahava in Hebrew means life. So moving past Hindus into Judeo-Christianity, we find that soils are life and that represents the emergence of human beings. And humanity, uh, to the bottom of the, of the picture here, represents an interesting uh, uh, change in Greek and Greco-Roman thought. Uh, so human, humanity, human beings share a root word in humus, which is the fertile topsoil of, of black and rich earth. So that's an interesting bit on soils. Uh, moving to maps, humans have been mapping the world for you know, eons and millennia. 
and really maps are representations of what we think of reality, but on a, on a scale that's larger than we're able to see with our eyes. Uh, so we create these models of reality um, and models come in different resolutions and different accuracies. And soils have been modeled and mapped again for maybe several decades, maybe 50 plus years. And our original ways that we collected soils to make soil maps were very laborious. So we'd go across the landscape, collect a bit of soil, uh, analyze it in a lab, then try to make sense of, of what the relationships are between landscapes and soils. And while some of them are, are very beautiful, this is an example that I particularly like from Kenya, uh, the, the usability of these maps are relatively limited. Uh, oftentimes spatial resolution is not at the level which we can use, and some of the properties that we can map are, are potentially not really available. Fast forward towards maybe 20 years ago uh, with the advent of computational technology, uh, moving mapping into the digital age uh, and then starting to include some better models. So for instance, Krieging and some of the really essential software that was developed was ArcGIS to present the first uh, sort of digital maps uh, for soils uh, in the world. And these were extremely useful and they continue to be useful. Uh, how then can we translate soil and soil maps then into fertilizer recommendations has always been um, the limiting factor. How can we make that jump between management and data analysis? So soil scientists and agronomists uh, have established again since maybe the 1950s or before a series of, of, of research trials, field trials, where we place into the landscape given a, a specific type of, of soil or landscape or cropping system that we think is representative for a larger region. And in these plots, then we do some sort of replicated trial. Um, for fertilizers, it mostly ends up being nutrient emission trials. So we have a bunch of plots and we remove nutrients from some plots and leave it in other plots. And then we put this together to assess what the optimum fertilizer recommendation would be for a particular area. Uh, and some of the typical analysis that we would do is we'd come up with a really simple uh, model. Um, oftentimes it's, it's linear that would represent given <clears throat> a specific fertilizer, or specific soil type and specific fertilizer, what would the recommendations be uh, for a particular area. And a lot of the difficulties has come from the assumption that the area that we chose and selected or areas that we selected for running these fertilizer field trials would be representative for larger areas with which we want to do management. Uh, some of the earlier um, examples of trying to extrapolate and infer uh, predictability across a larger landscape uh, have been developed again over the past 30 years, but largely these models have been relying on, on linear regression, uh, partially because that was the only really way that we had tools to analyze this type of data and put these types of things together. Um, and they were a very good first start, uh, but as we know, soils are incredibly complicated. Uh, so complicated that we really understand very little of what's happening in the soil plant continuum. And with the advent of more modern technologies, we should think about ways that we could update some of our existing models uh, using more appropriate technologies that have been recently developed. So this is where we turn to big data, uh, machine learning and, and other types of analytics coupled with really large data sets such as we get from remote sensing via satellite uh, have been used to transform many different things around the world. And we're just uh, over the maybe five, past five, six, seven years starting to apply these types of tools and approaches to soil and agronomy. One of the really interesting, at least I think is interesting, first examples uh, or early examples of applying machine learning and big data towards soils uh, was done from groups at ISRIC, which is the World Soil Information Program uh, housed in, in the Netherlands. And they put together a, a really nice methodology for taking satellite imagery, combining that with soil point data and random forests, which is a machine learning algorithm in order to, to create uh, spatially representative digital soil maps. So I'll run through the methodology quickly with you. 
Uh, we take a bunch of different environmentally important uh, covariates from satellite imagery. Typically, they tend to come from MODIS, Landsat, or, um, or Sentinel-2. And we layer them together on a particular geography or region of interests. And we include in that our soil point data. And from this layer stack of spatial images and data, uh, we then train the machine learning algorithm. Random Forest is just one of the many that have been used. And Random Forest is a decision tree based uh, machine learning model. And the machine learning model then uh, determines the relationship between all the covariates and the individual point data, which then allows us to extrapolate and interpolate uh, the, between the points for the given area, which with, we don't have soil representation samples. So that allows us to produce these types of maps on the right, um, which are, are pretty high resolution. And uh, one of the, the benefits is we can understand really the error, uh, which we couldn't get from a lot of the older models that we've been using. So our first case study comes from Mexico. Uh, I was working with CIMIT in Mexico and the government of, of Mexico had conducted uh, a lot of soil sampling campaigns over the past several years that really covered the entire uh, spatial distribution of landscapes across Mexico. So this is a really uh, interesting data set. It has 15,000 data points. And uh, on top of this, uh, through what Kai was mentioning is that he had been aggregating other data sets from soils that were generated from partners of CIMIT and but also within CIMIT at different states. So we put these uh, soil sets together and we ran them through the algorithms that I, I showed you earlier with a random forest coupled with spatial uh, covariate layering. And we were able to produce uh, a 250 meter grid cell map for at the national scale across Mexico, covering most of the soil chemical and physical properties. So this is just some examples of some of the, the maps that we were able to produce, um, some quite beautiful ones and also interesting spatial representation of, of the diversity of landscapes and, and soils that we have across Mexico. So a lot of this work has been done already, as I mentioned, um, ISRIC has done a lot of this work, AFSIS has done a lot of this work in Africa. Um, so one of the things that we're able to do from this uh, is create air maps. So we can me actually measure some of the air or predicted error that we would get from these maps, which allows us to understand a couple of things. One is it allows us to understand how accurate the maps are, and then two, it allows us to understand where we need to then do uh, more soil sampling campaign along the areas where we have higher uh, error in order to fill in the maps to produce uh, uh, maps with lower error rates. Uh, back to the interesting piece. Um, so. In, in parallel, as Kai was collecting this data sets and the government were collecting the data, CIMIT, one of the CIMIT's chief agronomists was working with uh, various organizations across Mexico, um, private uh, soil testing fertilizer labs, um, as well as the government agencies to create uh, fertilizer recommendations at the national level uh, based on soil uh, data and based on estimated yield potentials for maize. So we have these series of estimated yield potentials and from that we have recommendations for phosphorus, potassium and magnesium based on uh, soil testing. So what I did is I took this, uh, this table that was published in, uh, in this book that I show you here and we turned that into uh, sort of decision, uh, little decision trees that we use then to translate the properties from the soil into fertilizer recommendations. So now we're able to generate government sanctioned fertilizer recs um, at the 250 meter scale for all of, of Mexico, which was I think quite interesting. Um, it, there's a lot of, uh, I think it's an interesting first step and there's a lot of things I think we can do to, to understand how we can improve this and how we can validate some of this information. But as a first step, I think it was, it was quite interesting and we have good response from a lot of our partners and, and scientists within CIMIT and beyond. So the second case that I wanna present is a work that we did in Nepal. Uh, again, this is with CIMIT and this is where, where Jake came in uh, as part of the uh, sort of the analytical heavy lifting that we'll show you in a, in a bit. In Nepal, uh, the government as in Mexico had recently done a soil sampling campaign for most of the country. In this case, I'll just focus on the Tarai region, which is the southern plains of Nepal that border India, and it happens to be the most important uh, 
soil and agricultural zones for the whole country. So this, the government did maybe about 10,000 soil samples and we established uh, and helped them to create digital soil map for the country, also using the same tools and techniques that we had uh, from Mexico. Uh, unlike Mexico though, uh, Nepal had a, uh, largely lacking a lot of the support data sets that we needed in order to translate uh, soil recommendations into fertilizer recommendations. Um, it was largely lacking in national fertilizer recommendation uh, analytics and, and guidelines. So we had to really work from scratch. One of the things that we did is we did a, we executed a field camp sampling campaign where we went across the Terai in, Mexico, in, in Nepal and uh, sampled uh, several thousand farmers across a couple of different years measuring uh, yields on farm, but also understanding and asking them survey questions for management. So what are they doing and how are they managing it and what yield were they getting? In addition to that, we established uh, a series of spatially distributed fertilizer, uh, fertilizer response trials. So as I showed you earlier, these are the ones where we did a nutrient series of nutrient emission trials uh, distributed across the landscape. And we are trying to understand what the fertilizer response would be from a particular geography. Uh, standard sort of nutrient emission trials where we put uh, some areas without fertilizer, some areas with increasing amounts of fertilizer and we measure the yield response from that. So doing this, uh, you know, a lot of the same type of problems that we found in Mexico that Kai also talked about came up. You know, one is the costs of soil analytics. Soil analytics can be very expensive if they're available. And a lot of developing countries, such as Nepal, some of the more modern uh, analytical equipment, such as ICPs, are not available. So we have a lack of, of basic analytical techniques and high sampling costs. Uh, when we moved to actually taking the soil samples, I think the costs increased exponentially, especially if we want to do a soil sampling campaign that's spatially distributed across large landscapes at the national scale. And then even more expensive than that is executing field trials. Any field trial is just going to be very expensive. And if we want to get the distribution that's really representative of the spatial scales, it, the costs become really, really extreme. Uh, at this time, we were talking with um, Jake's professor, David Lobel, and seeing if they were interested in working with us to create uh, and start looking at new methodologies that we could deploy to try to scale um, the jump from soils and to fertilizer recommendations and how we can do this uh, more cost effective while maintaining accuracy and the reliability for some of the work that we're doing. So Jake, if you want to take over now. Good thing. Thanks, David. Um, Here, I'll like stop sharing my share screen. My screen? Okay. Yeah. Uh, visible yeah great so yeah as David was saying um, we were interested in finding a way to scale these uh, soil based fertilizer recommendations to national level and so in doing that we turned to satellite based methods um, essentially we want to leverage the fact that we have these large uh, national soil data sets um, and look at yields at all of these soil locations. Uh, unfortunately, it's very expensive to actually go out and physically measure yield at each of these soil locations, but we can use satellite estimates of yield as the, the next best thing. So that's what I'll talk about for the next few slides, is how we um, estimate yields across the country and then use this in our soil and fertilizer analysis. So in order to estimate yield um, from satellite, uh, we use a linear function of some satellite-derived vegetation index. Um, 
such as GCVI or Red Edge VI, um, as shown in the bottom left, uh, as well as a function of outer, so precipitation, temperature, radiation. And these are also from satellite-based sources. So we use MODIS for temperature and CHIRPS for precipitation. <clears throat> Uh, the first step in creating these yield maps um, is to identify where the crops of interest are. So uh, in this case in Nepal, we're starting with wheat as our crop of interest. Um, so during a field visit uh, in early April of 2019, um, I was in Nepal and we were conducting field visits and during these field visits um, I georeferenced points with uh, crop type labels as you can see in the top left and then in uh, Earth Engine drew polygons around each of the fields using a combination of the point locations and high resolution planet satellite data uh, which allowed me to segregate these fields and then sample data points within them. Uh, these were, these data were fed into a machine learning classifier, the random forest that David mentioned earlier, using um, raw bands from Sentinel-1 and Sentinel-2, as well as derived vegetation indices from the sensors. Um, and then we were able to predict crop type, whether it's wheat or some other crop with 90% accuracy using this algorithm. And then we can apply this model to imagery across the Nepal Terai in order to map wheat versus other crops, which this one alone is a very uh, important data layer, um, just mapping crop type. Normally crop land can be distinguished from forest land, but mapping individual crops is um, less common. <clears throat> once we have these, once we know where the crop of interest is growing, we can um, train and apply the yield models that I was talking about earlier. So um, in this case, we use two different methods for estimating yield and compare the two. Uh, one was a, excuse me, one was a crop cut calibrated method, which used the yield data collected by CIMIT during the uh, several years of field visits that David mentioned. Um, so we used those yields as the dependent variable and then used satellite measures of vegetation index and weather um, at those field locations as the predictors. Um, so we call this a calibrated approach because it's calibrated by the collected crop cut data. Um, but we also tried a uncalibrated approach, which uh, is labeled as skim yield in the figure in the top left. And so that follows um, the methodology developed by David Lobel in 2015, where um, the crop simulator AppSim is used to run um, a multitude of theoretical growing season scenarios for the crop of interest uh, using representative management and weather for the region. And then a statistical model is trained on the output of these process-based models. So in this case, the dependent variable is the simulated yield, the independence are the simulated uh, vegetation index and um, weather. So as you can see, the uncalibrated approach has some more bias, but is still accurate enough to get um, a yield prediction without intensive ground data collection. So, and then the bottom right, we can use these models. In this case, it's the crop cut calibrated, which is shown to predict yield at all areas of wheat, which we have satellite data. 
um, in order to generate these high resolutions, this 10 meter resolution um, yield maps for a, any given year. And then once we have these yield maps, we can combine them with our large soil data sets and begin to look at the relationship between crop yields and soils at a large scale. So in the top left, there's a figure of yield as a function of different soil parameters. Um, and also in this case, we use a nonlinear general additive model uh, with spline fits to each of the soil variables. Essentially, this lets um, a lot of nonlinearity, a lot more freedom in the relationship between soils and yield because as David mentioned, soils are very complex and restricting it to a linear model is not necessarily the most correct approach. And uh, from this modeling, we find that the two most important uh, soil characteristics in Nepal for crop yields are organic matter and zinc. Um, zinc, which has a, a optimal value of around 0 0.67 and organic matter, which tends to largely increase up to around 2%. And so we can take these nonlinear models and use them to identify these thresholds. Once we know these thresholds, we can apply them to the digital soil maps that were created for the region in order to map areas of deficiencies. So places where organic matter is less than 2.2% or zinc is less than 0.67 ppm. Um, these can be used to, one, just quantify the regional deficiencies for a given country. Uh, and additionally, to guide either more data collection, more uh, field trials, or even broad uh, fertilizer recommendations. So increase zinc fertilizer in an area that is largely zinc deficient, for instance. Additionally, we want to look at um, how fertilizer use interacts with soil quality. Are fertilizers more or less effective based on the soil type? Um, unfortunately, we run into a problem here where we have many soil characteristics which are potentially collinear um, and many different types of fertilizer. So all the possible interactions are difficult to model and uh, difficult to interpret. So we take an approach here, um, which has been used in previous work, um, specifically Mukherjee and Lau in 2014, where they summarize the soil characteristics into a single soil quality index, um, which is a holistic re representation of soil quality. Um, so in order to do this, we use uh, principal components analysis, which is another machine learning algorithm, uh, which identifies the most important variables um, as those which explain the largest amount of variation in the data. Um, we do this as a say, um, yeah, so, we do this to identify which variables are important and then also to attribute weights to them. So which ones are more or less important. Um, for each identified important soil variable, organic matter, clay, sand, boron, and zinc in this case, um, we scale them from zero to one based on a relationships that are known in previous literature. For instance, organic matter generally more is better, whereas boron and zinc generally have an optimal value where too much or too little uh, is detrimental to crop yields. And then we do a simple linear summing um, weighted by the relative variance explained by each of the principal components that the soil characteristics were identified by. All this is to say that eventually we get a single value for soil quality between zero and one, um, which we can then use to uh, stratify our soil sample and look at differential fertilizer responses.
so that's exactly what we do, as you can see in these figures. Um, we sample this soil quality, or we calculate it at each of the points of the survey data, um, where they have information about fertilizer use. So we, at each of these points, we have our estimated yields, we have soil quality index, and we have um, fertilizer use, and we can interact fertilizer use with the soil quality by separating the data into high soil quality or low soil quality based on whether it's above or below the median um, soil quality index and look at the linear response of yield to the fertilizer in each case. And so what we find here is that in higher soil quality, we actually see a smaller response to uh, nitrogen fertilizer than in lower soil quality. And the reverse is true for zinc. In high quality soil, we see a much greater response for zinc than in low quality soils. Um, so one interpretation of this could be that the high quality soils are not very deficient in nitrogen. Um, so they see less of a response. Whereas for zinc, um, the low quality soils are limited by something else besides zinc, so increasing the zinc does not matter, or perhaps the soils are not able to make the zinc available to the plants in a way that increases yield. So this is a fairly simple way to look at soil and fertilizer interactions, but again, this can be used to um, identify areas with low soil quality um, at a relatively high resolution the resolution of the soil grids. And based on these relationships between soils and fertilizer, we can begin to recommend which fertilizer will maximize yields in these locations. <clears throat> All right, Jake, maybe you leave it on your screen, Sharon, since you already have it. Uh, sure. Okay, so some of our conclusions was that uh, the remote sensing data and the machine learning tools uh, are, are really a, a scalable way to execute analysis across the landscape, um, which I think is a very positive and, uh, and interesting outcome from a lot of this work. Um, one of the things that isn't just unique to this study, but is unique to a lot of the big data approaches is that these machine learning algorithms are very data hungry and they require large amounts of data. And no matter how good we can make our models without good quality ground data, it's, it's very difficult to produce accurate models. So largely, it's been very difficult to get good quality ground data and a lot of the ground data is still scarce. So I think us as a community need to get together to see Maybe we all have different amounts of ground data that can be uh, shared and be pooled, or maybe we should think about how can we more effectively execute ground data collection campaigns. The next point is that uh, we see that machine learning tools and big data approaches are not going to be uh, substitutes for some of the traditional and really reliable ground data science that we've been doing. Rather, the synergies really increase in orders of magnitude if we combine the different efforts and the different tools that have been developed over the years into one more or less um, harmonious architecture. And, and from here, I think we can get the biggest benefit from all of the different approaches that we can take. Um, then the lastly, uh, these are, are predictions. The, the work that we've been doing um, in Mexico and also in Nepal are just predicting what's possible, potential outcomes that are possible. And it's, it's, I think it's very um, dangerous to think that we can make a jump from uh, prediction to application. And rather what we need is to fill in that missing boundary where we can use the predictions in order to generate hypotheses, which then we can test on the ground using validation trials. So it'd be great to, to see if we can you know, do this again um, and this time execute a, a ground validation campaign where we test some of the hypothesis and assumptions that were generated from the analytics in order to validate whether these things are actually going to be proving useful enough um, to change policy and to change, uh, let's say, product development, such as fertilizers. So that's it from us. Uh, thanks for listening. Maybe Kai, we put it back over to you um, to handle the Q&A session.
Yes, thanks a lot. Very enlightening. And I see we already have a couple of questions. Um, colleague Tegbaru Gobesi is asking whether you're working on topsoils or profile-based soil. Yeah, so we have, the data we have is for both topsoil and profile, um, but we've been focusing on the soil chemical properties of the topsoil, so the top uh, 15 centimeters for the work we're doing with fertilizers. Um, but it would be interesting to look at some of the profile uh, data, um, if we have it. I know that a lot of times profile data isn't available. Yeah, and then our colleague Keith Shepard is asking, in Mexico, how did you derive the fertilizer recommendations from the soil property map layers? Yeah, uh, so this work was um, done by Ivan Montesedio, who is the chief agronomist at, at CIMIT Mexico. And he worked with the government and with a bunch of fertilizer testing laboratories in order to put together and aggregate um, the fertilizer response data that had been done over many years in Mexico, but also looking at some of the, the algorithms that were developed for various locations in the United States. And then what they did is they did a, a rough estimation based on all the different calculations. What is uh, more or less an average uh, best guess interpretation of soil data to fertilizer recommendations? So then they, they had a basically like a, a cabal of deliberations between the most important or most influential policy uh, folks in soil science and agronomy from the public sector and private sector and agreed on, on what the recommendations would be. So while it wasn't using a lot of um, really, I think more modern analytical data-driven approaches, I think this is a very uh, standard approach um, of sort of consensus building based on existing data. Okay, so the next question, also from Keith, is uh, you used uh, the yield versus soil property to target zinc and boron fertilizer. How much of the yield variance did those properties alone explain? And maybe Jake, you wanna see about getting that one? Yeah, sure. Um, so, the, uh, we found that the soil zinc explained uh, about 3% of the variation in yield. Um, which compared to the literature is relatively low in absolute value. However, um, because we're using the satellite-based yield estimates, there's a lot of error uh, in both the yield estimate and also translating the exact location of the yield estimate to the exact location of the soil sample. Um, so we would expect that the effect size to be rather attenuated, uh, which is why generally in this study we're looking at uh, relative importance of um, different soil characteristics to each other rather than purely at the absolute value. So, um, but yeah, in general about um, on the magnitude of several percent of variation in yields. Okay, um, then the next question. Jake, are you able to see the Q and A's? Yes, yeah. Okay, maybe you tackle the next one too. By, yeah, uh, sure. Uh, by... Let, me, let me look. So Tegbaru says, 90% um, accuracy to estimate crop types, then maximum yield prediction with R squared of 0 0.56 using crop cut method, definitely have associated uncertainties and these uncertainties propagate to the final output, the fertilizer recommendation. I'm wondering how you're taking care of these uncertainties propagated to make decisions on fertilizer use. How did you set the cutoff point for the nutrients, for example, zinc deficiencies below 0 0.6 milligrams per kilogram? Uh, so, yeah, as I was just saying in the previous um, answer, there are definitely uncertainties. And so we hesitate to make definitive conclusions about exactly how much fertilizer is um, needed. Um, instead, we are looking at these um, relationships comparatively and as a way to guide uh, future validation work, as you, David, mentioned. So uh, we think this is a good method to identify um, 
areas of soil deficiencies and areas where certain fertilizer types are potentially more effective than others. But um, I would recommend that further work be targeted in these areas in order to validate these uh, hypotheses and um, confirm uh, actual amounts of fertilizers that would actually be uh, most helpful. And then for the second point, um, the cutoff points for the nutrients were based on the nonlinear responses that I showed in the figure. Uh, perhaps I can share that right now. So um, as you can see in the zinc figure, we get a maximum benefit to yield, which is on the y-axis, change in average yield um, at a value of zinc at around 0 0.67 ppm, which gives us our peak yield estimate. And then similarly for organic matter, we again reach a maximum benefit of yield of around at around 2.2%. Um, so we chose these values as thresholds where below which um, yield drastically drops off. Okay, so the next question from Keith is, a limitation of using existing farm yields is that you don't know which nutrient is limiting. You only had seven sites in Nepal for emission trials, so agreed need many more to calibrate remote sensing data. Yeah, for sure. Um, the more data that we have, the better the calibration is. Um, I would say uh, we had more sites than this, so if you can see my screen. So these are seven sites, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, that you talk about. Uh, but this is, this is a little misleading uh, because we're, if you have all of our sites listed, then it kind of gets a bit messy. So within the red circles here, um, these are the number of subsites that we had per larger region. Uh, so in total, we had 115 different sites and we did three reps in each site. So that's you know, over 300 uh, sites or 300 plots per, uh, per the whole thing. So it's a, little, it's a little bit more than that, but you're right. Um, you know, as I said, the limit, limiting factor is, is ground data. And uh, if we can do more ground data, then I think the data would be even more uh, vi viable um, as a product. Okay, the next question from Kamlesh Golani. Uh, can I see the presentation after completing the session? Will you provide it? Um, maybe Kai, I think. Uh, yeah, so we are recording this and uh, the link to the recording will be shared afterwards to the social media channels, Twitter and Facebook and others uh, that the, and the webpage of the community of practice of the big data platform. So will be yeah. definitely available. Okay. Uh, the next question, Harry Banez, uh, Aldave, how many samples per hectare is recommended? Is this methodology applicable to interpolate past and disease evaluating in the field? Oh, these are very good questions. Uh, I, I don't have a good answer for how many samples per hectare is recommended. I know that uh, sort of looking at sampling frames, uh, it's kind of the chicken and the egg, right? You, you really kind of know how many samples you need after you've done your sampling campaign and analytics, uh, which doesn't, it's not super helpful um, for planning. Um, but at, as I know, I mean, some of the best ways to look at data that you have already and see if you can understand the error and think about how the error can, can change given higher density of, of sampling. Um, and then the next one is just this methodology applicable to interpolate pests and disease in evaluating the field? Yeah, I don't know. Um, I know that one of our colleagues at CIMIT, um, Dave Hudson, is doing a lot of work with spatial understanding of pests and diseases. Uh, it may be useful to, to shoot him an email um, and see how, uh, how he's ap approaching looking at, at crop health issues um, from a spatial component. I know that, that he's doing a lot of mapping and machine learning too. Um, he'd be a great person to talk with. Okay, the next is from uh, Ivan at CIMIT. Is information generated through the study in Nepal being used by agronomists to make fertilizer recommendations currently? Uh, no. Uh, so we were working with the government on, on looking at fertilizer policy. Uh, 
principally the government has had a, a very interesting policy for fertilizer subsidy that was structured to subsidize urea on 60% and I think DAP on 18% subsidy. And so one of the things we're working with them is, is showing them the maps and showing them the different nutrient um, availability distributions across Nepal. And they were able to think about um, changing that subsidy to subsidize more with the phosphorus and less with the nitrogen. Um, but the work that, that uh, Jake has been doing is only only finished, uh, let's say this is what Jake, maybe a couple months ago? Yeah, I submitted it about a month and a half ago. So it's still under review. Yeah, so maybe once, if it, if it passes review and we get public publication from it, um, then I think it'd be useful to talk again with the government uh, of Nepal to see what the next steps might be. Um, I know, you, Ivan, you're thinking about working in, in Nepal with some of this data. Um, I think it'd be important to, the next step, as we said, would be to run validation trials. So a partnership with government um, on validating some of these assumptions, I think would be really uh, necessary and, and also interesting to see how these models then um, provide accurate estimations uh, once we can look at the validation data. Okay, next question is from Harry Banez Aldave. He says, I have basic knowledge of R and QGIS. I would like to learn the algorithms that you have shown. What books or authors do you recommend to apply? Uh, let's see. Um, uh, Jawu or Kai, do you know if we have, I know we've done um, some trainings on, on doing these types of things in the past. Uh, do you know if there'll be any, any trainings available in, in the future? I know that there's, um, there's one book called I mean, Statistical Learning and Inference, and it was published by Springer, and it talks about the different algorithms. Um, and I think there's some, uh, I, I certainly we can share some of the scripts for the soil data that we have um, for doing soil analysis. I'd be happy to share the scripts with you. Um, now, Kai and Jay Wood, do you know if, if we have any events lined up for, for training? Um, yeah, we, we had some training in the past, but this is actually uh, the, the new area, application in soil science. I, I think we, we should develop something like that. So yeah, appreciate the comment. Uh, yeah, David, let's follow up on that. I, I, I think there is a, yeah, there's a, big potential to make the code you use available and give a bit more in-depth look of behind the scene how you uh, run the analysis. Yeah. So, so yeah, let's, let's follow up on that. Sure, and I'd be ha so happy to jump on like uh, some calls or, or to go through the code to explain exactly how it's executed. Because I know it can be a little difficult using other people's code sometimes. <clears throat> okay, so the next question is from Tu Van Nguyen. A uh, question for David, using error mapping to inform sampling strategies seems very powerful. Are you starting to notice the adoption of these practices? Um, questions to both. To what extent is data, metadata, interoperability a challenge across the data sets that you utilize to input into your models? Um, so the first one for error mapping, uh, good question. You know, I, I, I haven't. Um, I know that all the times that I've looked at, at mapping soils, uh, the data has already been in existence. And it'd be very, we, we talk about this a lot with, with the people who execute national soil strategy uh, sampling campaigns in Nepal and also in Latin America and Africa. Um, and actually Keith Shepherd, who's I think on this call has done a lot of work doing this with AFSIS, the African Soil Information Service. Um, and it's certainly very powerful and very interesting, but I, I haven't had the opportunity myself to be a part of a group where we've done follow-up soil sampling based on error estimation, but that's certainly a very strong um, use. I'll answer a little bit on the second, and then maybe Jake can answer a little bit too. So he's talking about the extent of the data and metadata interoperability as a challenge. In a lot of the mapping that I've, I've done, um, we're using open access data set sources from uh, Google Earth Engine. So looking at, at Landsat and MODIS and Sentinel. And in this case, it's, it's pretty interoperable. The, you know, the only challenge is, is dealing with the different um, spatial resolutions. Um, so you need to uh, resample or, or sample up and sample down. Uh, but apart from that, it's particularly in Earth Engine, it makes it very, very um, easy to to work with um, spatial data. Jake, can you have any other observations? Yeah, I'll echo what you said. Um, we use everything that's accessible, um, publicly accessible through Earth Engine or even um, 
if you don't have a Earth Engine, you could download it from the um, satellite provider. I'd say probably the challenge is um, getting consistent and uh, ground data and um, trying to quantify like how much error is present in the either the locations of the data or the values of the ground data itself. Okay, next question from Amit. Uh, what do you think could be alternative of ground data? Given that ground data collection would be very costly and time consuming, this crowdsourcing can help. Also, the digital soil map in Nepal, I guess it's at 250 meters, and yield map is made using high res planet lab data. And additionally, land holding size is very small in Nepal. How do you think these things can be managed? Okay, so for the first one, uh, it would be great to see if we can use um, ground data, I mean, alternative to ground data. Um, I know that some crowdsourcing, there's a lot of uh, crowdsourcing that's been done using for plant health images. And I think a lot of that data, um, again, at, at Jake's lab uh, under David Lobel at Stanford, they've worked a lot with um, crowdsourced ground data for, um, for pest and disease and nutrient deficiencies and looking at crop type labeling. And I think uh, you'd have to shoot him an email, but I think that was coming up pretty good. Uh, I think yield estimations, yield measurements at the moment, I don't think there's really that great of a substitute from going into the field and putting on the crops and collecting the crops. Um, it'd be great to see if you can find alternatives for that, but at the moment, I don't know of anybody off the top of my head that has really good alternatives for that. And so the next one, the, the DSM in Nepal, 250 meters and yield map is high res. Uh, do you think these things can be managed? Uh, yeah, I, I mean, Sentinel-2 is now on board, so we're able to get uh, a lot higher spatial resolution. Um, as well as some of the Landsat imagery is also higher spatial resolution at 10 meters. Uh, I think the limiting factor is, is computational power. Uh, you know, for instance, for the maps that we made in, in Mexico at 250 meter resolution, it was several billion pixels. So we come up with, with sort of physical limitations of computational power, which oftentimes we can get around if we have um, cluster-based computing, but you know these things also have their their challenges associated with them. Uh, I, I would say at the moment it's probably computational resources are the ones that are, are really limiting the the spatial resolution. Um, also, knowing that if you want to do anything longer term besides like 2016, 2015, then we don't have the the Sentinel-2 um, imagery yet, uh, or then. Um, so this is also some limitations. But certainly uh, for smaller farmer systems in Nepal and other parts of, let's say, Africa or parts of Latin America where plot sizes are really small, then something like 10 meter resolution is certainly much better. Yeah, I, I agree with that. And so the high resolution yield mapping um, helps us get accurate yield predictions because we're not uh, contaminating the pixels with like urban areas or roads or field boundaries, et cetera. Um, and in order to compare those with the 250 soil maps, we can aggregate them up knowing that our yield predictions are more accurate at the small scale. So um, at the aggregated level, they'll also be more accurate. And then we can, we're not, I don't think we're at the point yet where we can make um, predictions between soils or analyze the relationship between yields and soils at the 10 meter level, but at the 250 meter level or the village or district level, then that's much more uh, reasonable. But having uh, greater accuracy at the high resolution with yield production does help even at those aggregated scales. Okay, next question from Tu Van Nguyen. Have you come across examples of effective data pooling connecting data producers and data scientists slash modelers. Uh, yeah, uh, I mean, in all the, all the examples that we showed, um, this sort of happened. Uh, in Mexico, the government and other partner institutions and organizations collected a lot of the soil data. Um, Ivan partnered with uh, a lot of the agencies across Mexico to collect the um, fertilizer response data. Uh, and then we were involved and in, in led the, the modeling and data science components. So this was a, a nice example. Um, in Nepal, same thing. 
the government uh, collected all the, the soil data um, and then we uh, partnered with them on doing a lot of the modeling. We also partnered with ISRIC um, in the Netherlands to, to run some workshops uh, with the government on learning how to, to, to execute these models. Um, Keith's effort I mentioned is also uh, at least on this call and they did uh, some really great work um, with AFSIS, the African Soil Information Service, where uh, it was a partnership between a bunch of different institutions. I think the World Agroforestry Center was maybe the one who led it. Um, and they partnered with a bunch of governments and other organizations across Africa to collect the data. And then um, the AFSIS project uh, had the data scientists and modelers who are running the algorithms. Um, another example is in India. At the moment, there's um, Indian Soil Information Service that's uh, been in operations. It's a, I think a BMGF funded project uh, that Simit's one of the key people on. And the government of India, the different states in India are collecting the data and then Simit and Simit's data scientists and modelers are the ones who are uh, then using the data to collect or to, to derive products so maps and other things. So I think there's some great examples and it's just a matter of having the right um, partnerships and collaborations. Uh, the next question is from um, Boniface Akuku. Is it possible to use historical soil testing data for different regions to test the model? If yes, which variables are critical? Uh, I would say, yeah, I mean, all the data sets that we've presented here, soil data sets have been historical. Um, some of them were just a year or less, some of them were more. And I think it depends on the type of variable that you're that you're interested in, in looking at, you know, pH and maybe uh, some of the physical properties are probably more reliable um, from older data sets, whereas some of the more volatile ones, nitrogen, maybe organic matter, um, some of the nutrients are probably less reliable with older data sets. So it depends on, I think, what you're trying to map and what you're trying to, to do with the maps um, and how old are your data sets. I think there's not really any good that I know of um, assessment. And this really has to be based on, I think, people's own judgments. Uh, next question from Adamola Bremo. Uh, one would expect landscape factors, especially topography, to be an explanatory factor in yields in the study area. Did you include landscape variables in your model? Jake, you want to handle this one? Yeah, yeah, I didn't mention this uh, in detail, but yeah, we included both weather and topography controls in our yield modeling. Uh, do you know which weather and topography? Um, so for, we included um, average temperature in the early season, so November and December, and in uh, the late season, so February to April. Uh, we also included uh, rainfall for this and radiation for the same times. And um, for topography, we had slope and elevation as controls in our regressions. Okay, next question from, uh, let's see, it's Kobe Conrad Abelera. Given that soil sampling procedures can be costly, and as we mentioned in the question, crowdsourcing can be helpful. I'm just wondering if we can find alternatives for laboratory tests involved in characterizing soil chemical properties. Are there current technologies capable of finding the correlation between certain soil physical properties um, to quantify soil chemical properties? Oh, this is a good question. Um, I would say one of the experts, uh, Keith Shepard, who's in this is one of the, the experts in in doing this, they've developed a really cool technology using mid-infrared spectroscopy um, to substitute or supplement um, some of the soil, uh, traditional wet chemistry soil sampling tests. I know that it works really well for pH, um, uh, let's see, CEC, organic matter, total nitrogen, um, and you can do more rapid uh, throughputs. So maybe a couple hundred samples per day and the costs that I've seen have been reduced to maybe $1.50, $2 um, per soil sample. Um, so that's a really interesting, I think, way of, of reducing some of the costs for soil sampling. Um, there's some talk we had before about looking at air maps from existing uh, maps. Uh, and so that could also lead to cost reduction through targeting of specific soil sampling areas in order to improve um, algorithm and model prediction. 
There's been a lot of work also on sort of in situ uh, soil sampling and soil analysis, um, some using uh, spectroscopy techniques, and other ones using more low cost wet chemistry. I know there's one called Soil Doc, which was produced by Columbia University um, a while ago. Um, that's been kind of a low cost field collection tool for wet chemistry data. Um, there was a company that I think it doesn't exist anymore, but it's called Soil Cares, and they had a, a field tool for uh, spectroscopy. Um, so there's a lot of really interesting existing approaches, uh, but I think this is also an area where um, new ideas uh, and sort of innovation research can be used to see how we can get around some of these cost problems. Uh, next question is from... Oh, uh, David? Yeah. Uh, sorry, I, so we are running out of time it's already. Okay. Uh, then, so yeah, we, we haven't been able to answer all the questions, unfortunately. But yeah, thanks, thanks everyone for okay. participating and asking great questions. So we, we will have a kind of note of all your questions and kind of chat messages. So we will try to answer, uh, correct answers for those questions we couldn't address today uh, in the follow-up message. We will make a, a post. We will have a page on the Big Data uh, the platform website uh, where we will have the video of recording of today's webinar uh, as well as the presentation and the yeah, discussion note. So before we close up, uh, David and Jake, can you please turn on your camera just to make sure people know who you are? <laughs> so we haven't been sharing our faces. Actually, let me do that too. Hey, good Hello. to see you, David. And yeah, this is me and uh, Jake. Okay, great. Uh, so Hi, you're great. there. And Kai uh, from uh, Simit, do you have camera ready? Just so quickly. Okay, uh, and Keith, uh, so Keith, we have Keith Shepard in the participant and we just upgraded you to the panelist. <laughs> uh, Keith is the uh, father or grandfather of digital soil mapping and leading access effort from ECRAF. Uh, so Keith, do you have, I don't know if you're still there. Uh, so do you have some final remarks before we close the meeting? If you can unmute. Uh, no, just to say a uh, great oh, yeah. job um, to David uh, um, um, and, uh, um, and Jake. Um, and great to see you still doing this work and carrying, carrying the flag. Um, and, um, you know, we look, see, look forward to seeing more from you, um, uh, certainly in this area. Yeah. Okay, fantastic. Great. Uh, thanks. Okay, so I think we have to wrap up today. Um, yeah, thanks again, everyone. And uh, Kai, I will I'll bring it back to you to close up the webinar today. Yeah, thanks a lot to the presenters, to all the people taking time out today on a special day. I hope uh, you learned something. We will publish this afterwards. If you want to get in contact with the with Jake or with David about specific questions in the future, and um, thanks again to everybody involved. Bye-bye. Have a good Friday. Bye-bye. Thank you.